Well, good morning. You know how I'm doing? I'm outstanding, improving, and getting better by the minute. I'm always on top of the mountain. It's just sometimes the mountain's upside down. But if it's a valley, it's leading to another mountaintop. Good to see you. Good to see me too. You get up in the morning, you don't see yourself. It's a bad day. Well, it's really a good day. You'll be of Jesus. Everybody makes mistakes, even God. Just look around. Take your nose, for instance. Who would put that upside-down, drippy thing over your mouth? If the sanitation department were to inspect it, they'd give you 15 days to have it fixed or to move it. But where would you move it to? If you moved it down here, every time you sneezed, your shirt would fly open. If you moved your nose back here when you sat down, you'd suffocate. If you turned it upside down, in Oregon, where I'm at, with all the rain, you drowned. Well, maybe God knows best after all. We out in uh, Beaverton, where I live, about a year ago, there's a little lady on TV. It was her 108th birthday, and she was out dancing. Not very fast, but she was dancing. And she gave up horseback riding, riding at 104. And the reporter came over, and he put a microphone in front of her, and he said, What's the secret of your longevity? And she said, Keep breathing. <laughs> so uh, let's just keep breathing. We'll go on. Archaeology is a career that leads one to ruins. You want to be married to an archaeologist because the older you get, the more he loves you. <laughs> We're going to go over to Egypt this morning. And uh, the sheer splendor and unrivaled grandeur and unsurpassed majesty of these relics of the past uh, invites uh, anticipation of how they were built to see them rising up out of the desert is to experience wonder. How did they build them? Uh, you know, there's a, before we can unlock the future, we must first find the keys to the past. And there's a sort of chronological snobbery, a conspiracy of conceit among evolutionists that our civilization is the epigee of all civilizations and that everything that came prior to us is archaic and outmoded and outdated and primitive, that there's been a linear progression, that mankind has been slowly climbing the staircase of knowledge in an ever-ending upward ascent. And suddenly he emerged into space-age sophistication. And evolutionists, as they tell the story, why just a few thousand years ago, our ancestors were cowering in caves, beetle-browed, barrel-chested, bow-legged, bulging biceps, hairy back, brutes, club-carrying, peanut brain, drooling, knuckle-dragging savages. And why we are bionic-brained, the latest and the greatest, and those back there were just mental morons. Well, towering over the Giza Plateau in Egypt is what the Encyclopedia Britannica calls the greatest single building ever built by mankind. Soaring into the sky, towering more than 49 stories tall. They are a magnificent masterpiece of technical skill. Consisting of more than 2,300,000 limestone blocks of 2.5 tons each and cyclopean stones of 40, 60, 80, 100 tons, even unbelievably 200 tons. A 200 ton stone is the equivalent of 500 family size automobiles. And the Cheops Pyramid is so large that you can place 877 wide-bodied, jumbo-sized jets inside of it and still have plenty of space to spare. And yet they tell us the preposterous comment that all of this was built without wheels or pulleys or any modern equipment. There are some of the blocks 
this structure of the pyramids more than anything else on the planet is proof positive that there was an ancient civilization that superseded ours in some ways. Anyone with any degree of expertise in archaeology, astronomy, architecture, mathematics, when they looked at these megalithic monuments, they realized that they are dealing with a technology that we do not comprehend, that is outside of ours. There is ample archaeological evidence that there was a civilization of unparalleled sophistication that arrived here around 3,000 B.C., 5,000 years ago. And just to look at the be at the Giza Plateau and to stare up at those magnificent monuments is just everyone needs to at least take one trip there and to experience and look at them. Do you realize that Abraham looked at the pyramids and Moses and all the others? You know, Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees. You know, he was going out not knowing where he was going. Ur. Somebody asked you, where are you from? Ur. No, I ask you, where are you from? Ur. No, wait, I'm asking you, where are you from? Ur. Sounds like a caveman grunt, doesn't it? But Abraham, you know, when he was 116 years of age, Isaac got his driver's license. <laughs> Pacing up and down in the tent going, sit down, Sarah said, sit down, Abraham. How can I? Isaac's out there on a two-hump, four-speed camel with racing stripes roaring across the desert. And inside the complex are these tunnels. And they do not deviate even one sixteenth of an inch. They go down several hundred feet. They do not deviate even a little bit. We cannot construct a tunnel like that today. How do they do it? We don't know. And not only that, is anybody still breathing out there? Yeah. I was preaching at one church and a guy had a heart attack. They called the paramedics. They came and removed the back eight rows before they found the right guy. Now, that's a dead church. <laughs> the people should have been speed bumps out in the parking lot. And so we see these tunnels. Not forgetting that at one time there were more than several hundred thousand 16-ton white stone, limestone blocks covering the outside of the pyramid that were polished to optical precision. Such precision to the optical precision of a con, to a contact lens that even today when you go there you cannot put a razor blade between the cracks. And you see that white, it used to be when you go into the desert, before the Muslims came and they began to tear off the outer uh, sand, uh, limestone blocks and for building material. But you know, Moses played there. Moses was once a basket case. Let's hope for some of you. Rose to be second in command of Egypt. He knew the secret of the pyramids. Plinius, the historian, when he went there, he witnessed the Egyptians climbing up on the side and using it kind of a slide to have fun. They would slide down. The, the blocks were so smooth, and there was a big pool of water, like a giant water slide. When I was a boy, my mom used to say, Dennis Lee Swift, if you fall out of that tree and break your leg, don't come running to me. <laughs> Can you imagine Moses' mom saying, hey, you slide off there and hurt yourself? All right. Those are the blocks. We cannot do that. We can't get people to build sheetrock and put it together to, to within 0 0.1 inch. They did it on the whole side. And you know what they tell us? Well, they did it with copper tools and wooden mallets. Well, you can use copper tools with diamonds embedded in abrasive and cut through some soft limestone 
but not granite and diorite. To say that they used copper tools to cut through granite and diorite would be like me saying that I used a knife of butter to cut through steel. Nova, hey, we're so smart we can't even explain how they did it. Nova TV said, the Americans went over there and said, all right, we'll build a 20-foot pyramid and show you how they did it. One-ton blocks. But they went out and they used not copper tools to cut the limestone blocks. They used modern equipment. Then they started to put it together and they made mistakes. And the blocks, if you look closely, are about a half inch apart. They couldn't finish it. So the Japanese came over and said, we'll build a 30-foot pyramid and show you how they did it. They used equipment off the side, same thing, cut the blocks. But when they got to the top, the half-ton capstone to put it on, just a half-ton to put it up to the top, using what they call ramps and everything, they couldn't put it on correctly. One guy was almost killed. Now, the typical explanation as you look at the pyramids is they say they built a ramp. Now, this is them trying to build the pyramid here, the modern. But if I were to back up to the other one and you look at Cheops, the largest pyramid, did you know it would take a ramp one mile long? And it would weigh so much it would collapse. And then they say they were using these, these rollers and they had ropes and they're pulling them up to the top. You know what, if you had every, every, every three feet a guy with a rope and you had hundreds of people, to move a 200 ton stone, it'd take you maybe seven, 800 men at least. When they're getting to the top, the ramp goes to the top like this, as they're pulling the rope, where are the men going? <laughs> ah! You, you can't do it that way. Hmm. In about 1998, this is uh, three quarters of a mile on the other side of one of the pyramids. They found this village, and inside the tunnels, they called the Egyptian pyra- uh, President Mubarak, and he came and went in the tunnel. I've been there. I've not been inside the tunnel. But you know what they found? They have now found evidence. The Hebrews never worked on the pyramids. You know, you see those movies, Charlton Heston, <laughs> and all the Hebrew slaves cowering under the rip, a whip. <laughs> No, no, they built mud bricks down in Goshen, but they didn't work on the pyramids. And by the way, what if we get up to heaven and Moses doesn't look like Charlton Heston? (laughs) What if he looks like Don Knotts? (laughs) And he probably will because they were small, Semitic people were five, five, two, they were very small people. But it shows that there was an elite class of people building the pyramids. Not thousands and thousands, but hundreds. And they found the bakery and what was going on there. They had some kind of technology that superseded ours. Well, do you believe in prayer? How many people believe in prayer? Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. And many times I pray, say, God, uh, show me what you want done. And... A couple of years ago, I just felt this dynamic mental impression that that was the time for me to go back to Egypt. I went and booked a ticket online, $1,000. The next day, out of nowhere, a guy calls me and said, hey, I, I want to give you $1,000. At church, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm not a beggar. People say, who sponsors you? I go all over the world. Tiger Woods is sponsored by Nike. Michael Jordan was sponsored by the NBA. Race car drivers are sponsored by Texaco. I'm sponsored by the living God. And God's got more chains than all the money in the universe. Anyway, I booked that ticket. I went over to Egypt. And he had the a little camel music. And I found a guy up on the pyramid uh, plateau. His family had worked up there for 20 years. And I told him what I wanted. And we went behind where nobody else goes. And what we found is evidence of high machinery use of long tools. You see this granite, there's a granite block there. You you probably can't see it without a pointer, but there's a saw right through it. It's like where they cut it. Sir Flanders Petrie, the great archaeologist, when he went there, he worked on the pyramids and he wore a pink ballerina costume. 
You know why? Everybody thought he was crazy, but the Muslims would leave him alone back then. So they, and he spent. But what Sir Flanders Petrie found evidence of is that they had saws, nine feet long, circular saws going through to cut the material. Diamond tipped. Inside of sarcophaguses, when we use a drill, zzz, if you look at it, it leaves little whirl marks as it revolves around and around and around. Inside there, under magnification, they found symmetrical spirals that they used the sarcophagus granite and they drilled down into it cores. Or when you cut through pine wood, you're using a circular saw, zzz, zzz, Sometimes you go too fast past the pencil mark where you marked it, and it cuts too far, and then you back out. They found evidence in granite and diorite. Now, diorite is what we use to cut diamonds. In diorite, sometimes they made mistakes, and you could see where they went too far so fast so suddenly, and then they backed out, and they filled it in. Sir Flanders Petrie's estimated that it was 500 times faster than any piece of drill bit that they had at the time. Not only that, he wrote that they were familiar with the use of a lathe as we are in our modern tool shops. That was, over, that was in the 1880s. Here's a radius gauge out behind one of the, where they carved the diorite. What we use is a computer apparatus. If you're going to make it circular and, it, and you're going to carve it just right, it goes down. They were able somehow to make perfect round pillars that we cannot do. Here's a statue that they pulled back, gave the guards a little bashis, some money, and it shows that what happens, and it's unfinished, and this is a probably about 30 feet high, laying on the ground behind one of the pyramids, and it shows what happened is when they were forming it, it came out suddenly. They were using it. It was coming very quickly. And this is an unfinished one. It shows the evidence of a high-speed technology. These are diorite statues. In the beginning of the civilization, we know that around 3,000 B.C. How long ago was the flood? Approximately. 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One guy said to me, very bourgeois, sophisticated guy, he said, my family genealogy goes back a thousand years. I said, well, our family records were lost in the flood. <laughs> when Noah was on the ark, the boys came to him and said, Dad, can we go fishing? He said, sure, boys, but go easy on those worms. We just got two of them. <laughs> Did you ever think that when Noah, before the flood, he was in the minority, but after the flood, he was in the majority? He preached his first sermon at 500 years old and restarted the world when he was about 641. This is an obelisk. It's about 900 tons. In the 1970s, we had a piece of equipment that could move a 160-ton block. Some of the stones at Giza on the Sphinx are 200 tons. And we used to have this piece of equipment, it'd take six weeks to set it up, and you'd move a block and it'd take three weeks to reset it up to do another one. And then we went up into the 80s at about a 300 ton cranes. Now we have something that could lift a 900 ton stone, but we couldn't move it around, we could just move it up in the air. They quarried these things and moved them down the river of the Nile and set them in place. They tried to duplicate it with, you know, about five ton deals, trying to move it that way, what they thought they couldn't get them up like that. They even found evidence of a 1,200 ton stone that they were quarrying in Aswan that they stopped and they were cutting it out. This is a sarcophagus. You know, I'm the exclusive Northwest distributor for microwave fireplaces. Yeah, why waste hours before the fire when you can enjoy the entire evening in eight minutes? I also sell Tupperware caskets. Beats the high cost of dying. They burp when you close them. They're eight feet long. Throw in a little lettuce, guaranteed to keep you fresh for six days. They can double as a salad bar in the foyer of your church. Okay. This is a sarcophagus. 
I have a little more to that little routine, but we're on time this morning. Okay. Uh, this is a sarcophagus. It's about 10 feet long. It's made out of granite. And inside what they found is we can go into a shop and have a machinist make something with the high-tech equipment about that long that doesn't deviate where you could look at it underneath with a light and there's nothing, nothing. It's just uniform perfection. But they did it for eight, nine, 12, 15 feet long in these sarcophaguses. When you look inside and it's beveled out and you put one of those lights under it, it doesn't go to the other side. It's perfect, precisioned. And by the way, in the Indiana, all the limestone quarries in Indiana, they ask them, how long would it take to quarry enough blocks to build one of those pyramids for the pyramids in the Giza Plateau? They said if all the quarries work nonstop 24 hours a day, for 27 years, they could cut it and they could move it by train to the site, but they wouldn't have it constructed, the beginning of the construction. Can you imagine that? We asked about a sarcophagus, building one that size. They said we could do it. It cost you about $125,000, granite, diorite. But we'd have to send it to you in five different pieces, cut apart and then reassemble it on the site. Look here. This is at the Cairo Museum. You see what happened? They were using some kind of machine that beveled it at the top. Rounded it out. Unrivaled sophistication of what they were doing. What we see is the beginning when they came there. Uh, Walter Emery, who is an eminent Egyptologist, there are skeletons from about 3000 BC. They are larger, they have bigger heads, they're not like modern Egyptians. And what they did is they said, there had to be a race of a people that came of somewhere else from a prior civilization outside of us. You know, Egyptologists say about 5,000 years ago there were these nomads and Bedouins lumbering along on the back of donkeys and swaying camels. They came to our land and slowly they became over hundreds of years intellectual geniuses. No, 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 no. There was no buildup from outside. It was immediate. It was all there in the beginning. And in fact, the best is from around 4,500 years ago, approximately. And then it devolved. It went down. Here's the pyramids from the sky. They're astronomically aligned. Uh, they're lined up with the constellation of Orion in the sky, just like the sp spider. Out, I showed you the people out in the desert of Nazca. In many of the Indian civilizations here in America, they align things to the constellation Orion. Why? I don't know. Perhaps the constellations of stars and the magnetic pull of the earth and everything else helped them to lift stones. That's another discussion. Here's the Sphinx. The silent Sphinx stands as a solitary sentinel staring out at the scorching sea of sand in the Sahara. And the mute monument breaks her silence and speaks and tells us that her feline body that is eroded was not by swirling sand or the dirt, grit of dirt, but by water. Robert Schock, Boston professor, jolted the rigid ego academic establishment with an impressive array of geological evidence that even though the desert jealously guards her secret, we know that that was not wind that carved the body of the Sphinx, that it was water. About 4,000 800 years ago, the eastern Sahara Desert was a savanna, a tropical area. Water torrentially poured down, and out of that perpetual drenching, and I believe it was built somewhere out to the floor. I, I, this is just opinion, okay? As Ken Holvine said, this is the book of second opinions. I don't know for sure. Nobody does know. Aren't you glad you came to... Oh, yes. It was buried up to this neck in sand for centuries, and the Turks used it for target practice. Napoleon, while he's over there, his soldiers turned the canyons on it, cannons, and knocked the nose off of it with cannon fire. This is Saqqara, about uh, 16 miles of, across the desert to, from and the ancient city of Memphis. They were excavating there in the 1890s, and they found over 30,000 of these vases. The vases are of amethyst, diorite, granite, and other very hard materials. Do you see the one of the, the white one? It's, it's a tip. It's a, it's a diamond tip, and it's perfectly balanced. 
Some of the vases, when they look down inside of it, at the bottom of the vases in granite and diorite, there are hieroglyphics. They are so small that we, used to have, we have to use a microscope to magnify it to see what's written there. How did they cut down into that stone, use minuscule, small lettering? Here's another one, perfectly balanced. Precision impossible. You know when we use tubular drilling, core drilling, and you start at the top, it tapers down, and it leaves a plug at the bottom when you pull it out? Sir Flanders Petrie found evidence of that going on. That they used some kind of tool when it went down, it left a plug at the bottom. That it's tapered. And it had the symmetrical spirals. But what amazed him was, as it went down and whirled down, our modern drill, that it goes down 500 plus revolutions a minute, 900 plus revolutions, as it go down so many millimeters, he found that the drill rate for the Egyptian artifacts had to be 500 times faster than the drills they had at their time. Still breathing? Here's some of the vases. Exquisite. Do you know these were the most prized objects of Rome? I'm sure you've all read Plato late at night as a tranquilizer to go to sleep. But uh, Plato mentions that Caesar and Nero and the, and the great Caesars of Rome, they knew how to work in marble and granite, but you know what they wanted above everything else? Is one of these vases. Nero paid for one over $500,000, equivalent of American money today. Caesar paid over $2 million for one. Not only that, you know when we use like soft metal, we have a machine that goes down and it presses at the top and then it shoots out at the side and goes, zzz, 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 has metal pieces to carve it in the inside? Are people still thinking here? The Baptists still think. <laughs> so what happened was, but we can't do it. How would you do that? It just, it's small at the top. How do you put something in there and then carve it out on the world on the inside? How did they do that? Would you like me to answer what I think? Oh. Could you come back next Sunday? You'll have to go all the way to Oregon to where I am, church. Here's plates in the Cairo Museum. Here's a bowl. I want to show this bowl. See it? See it? See it? See it? Look at the bottom. You know bowls, if they're round on the bottom, when you look like they're going to tilt like this. This one, they knew exactly what all the weight was. They knew how to carve it in such a way. And at the bottom, when you put it there, it wouldn't tilt in any way. They left us evidence that they superseded our civilization in some ways. Now, here's what happened. And we'll get to this in just a second. I was praying one day. Does anybody out here believe in prayer beside me? And I was going to be on the call ball program, TBN, Totally Brainless Network. I mean, totally believable network. He has a great program, Creation Evidence for 21st Century. I was going to talk about the high-tech pharaohs, except I didn't have any objects. I started praying. I felt in my spirit. I was just felt certain that the Lord somehow was saying in my spirit, you shall have them. It wasn't a few days later that I got two of these. This one is 1300 to 1800 B.C., 3000 but, uh, you know, 3,000 plus years ago. It's diorite. It's in mint condition. Whoa! Perfectly balanced. Wow. It shows. I could put it on TV. Six million people. And they could see it. God knew where that was all those years. Did you know that? And by the way, he knows where your life is too and what to do with everything you've had and everything you didn't have. Isaiah 45, 16 says, Behold a new thing. Uh, it springs forth. You look at the Bible, it says suddenly, immediately, quickly, straightway. Suddenly, your situation is one way and the next day it changes. One day you're in a hellish place, the next day you're in a heavenly place. God prepares slowly to move suddenly. For 420 years, the, the, the Israelites were down in Egypt. And Moses comes along and he says, and God says, I've heard your cries. I've seen your affliction. I know your situation. I have come down to deliver you. 
and he comes all the way down to where you are today and out of your affliction and out of your sorrow and out of your suffering, I'm telling you, he's listening. And there comes a moment where there's a suddenly and he told them, he said, don't even put the yeast in the bread. Don't have time to rise because baby, pack your bags, your bags, your jam, we're going, getting out of here. All right. Here's the thing about that. The suddenlies of God. You know, it says when the church was born that suddenly there was a sound of a much riding, mighty rushing wind. Acts 2, 2. It says that when and Paul and Silas were in jail in Philippi, that suddenly God sent an earthquake and immediately the doors were opened and they were released. God's going to move quickly in some people's situations. There's a suddenly. And suddenly... I ended up with these. And this one, I like this guy who was working on this one because he flunked shop. Inside of this vase, he didn't finish it off. Do you see this? There's a plug in the bottom. Now, here's what they did, I, possibly. Because in granite, there's quartz in Fieldspar and mica. And when they examine these objects, you'll see the spiraling down like this, but it cuts through the quartz faster than the granite. The quartz is harder than the granite. The quartz, it should be shallower and take longer to cut through it. But if you're using an ultrasonic drill that's vibrating at 19,000 to 25,000 vibrations per second, when it's vibrating, in that air and that sound, it sets up a symphonic vibration. The quartz vibrates in harmony with it. And so when it gets to the quartz, it goes through faster. Isn't that amazing? Woo! All right, here's this right here. I got time, maybe a couple little illustrations. When the Hoover Dam was being built in the 1920s, a guy named Warren was with the General Electric, and I don't know if you know this, there was so much electricity going to come out of there, they were trying to find out what the insulators for the, the wires should be. And in the laboratories, no matter what material they would use, when they bombarded it with a high degree of electricity, high current, it would explode. It would explode. It would explode. They had no material to insulate the lines. Hoover Dam was almost completed. President... Hoover called Warren himself. He said, what are we going to do? You got a dam, but no way to carry the electricity. That lots of voltage. He was a praying man. He went upstairs and he started praying. He said, God, what am I going to do? And God, just, he felt. Read John chapter 2, the first miracle of the wedding at Cana. Well, that's a good deal. God, here I am trying to help. And, and the jars, suddenly he felt the, something about those jars where Jesus turned the water into wine. And he felt, I'm going to get an answer from God. God's going to help us. He went downstairs. He told his wife, we're going to get an answer. They've been working nonstop his laboratory for two years. He said, first, we're going to take a vacation for a month. Give the employees a month off. Go anywhere you were, go, want to go, but you come back, we're going to solve this problem. God's going to answer. How do we be able to ceramic jars of Cana of Galilee? There's this pastor, he was driving, he was swerving on the road, and highway patrol him, pulled him over. He said, you been drinking? No. What's in that bottle on the passenger side? Water. Let me have a sip. It's wine. Pastor said, he did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try that. <laughs> All right. So what happened? One of his employees came back. He said, where'd you go? He said, I went to Egypt. Because Howard Carter, who was also a Bible-believing Christian, had prayed for years, and he found King Tut's tomb. And while he was there, one of the guards gave him a piece of porcelain. And so he said, oh, yeah, I got a piece of porcelain. And Warren said, oh, okay. He just didn't think about it. And then in the middle of the night, he reminded him, about the ceramic jars, about John chapter 2. And he called the guy in his office in the middle of the night. He said, where's that piece of porcelain? He said, why? Are you going to call the authorities and have me arrested? It was just a little piece of porcelain they gave me. He said, no, 
Let me see it. They analyzed it, and they bombarded it with high-voltage electricity. It would not explode. So the Egyptian porcelain was what they began to analyze and reconstruct to use for the insulators for high-voltage wires. You heard it here first. Got to move along quickly. I know this gentleman. He's the Cairo Museum. He's a Middle Kingdom uh, authority. And here's uh, the Saqqara bird in 1891. They found in Saqqara in the pyramids what they thought was a bird-like object. They put it in the basement in the boxes. A guy in 1971, an Egyptologist, was rummaging around down there. He opened up the boxes. He was a model glider enthusiast. And it looks, this is the official museum photograph, it looks like an airplane, a glider. The part of the piece of the tail is off. It's like this. It has even a stripe around the outside of the wing. And if you do it like this, it'll fly and glide. Now, I'm not saying they had airplanes with motors or anything, but they understand the, the, the aerodynamics. In fact, a replica of this was sent to the National uh, Social, uh, Museum of Space and Aeronautics in Washington, D.C. And they have it as an example of the first example of flight. Oh, an excellent book. You need to get this book. Uh, the, the Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation has the best graphics, the nice, natural graphic quality, and it talks about all this kind of stuff, and it's in there, and boy, it's right out here. And I was, did the, most of the research on this book, The Puzzle of Ancient Man, that will talk about many of these things right here. We have them out here at the table. All right. Oh, this is an interesting object. Are we still okay? Are you glad you came to church today? I think boredom is a sin against the Holy Spirit, by the way. Holy shoddy, still shoddy. He's the God of the superlative. We should be passionate champions of excellence. And then we try to package in such a way that it communicates and keeps people going and inspires you to go do something for Jesus Christ. This boat inside the Cairo Museum, do you know what they found when they were excavating Tiananmen in Mexico, outside of Mexico City? They found one of these boat, boats, an Egyptian boat. Was there transatlantic contact? Possibly so. This is Egyptian mask. Moses gave up the King Tut's mask. It's 68 pounds, solid gold with a little bit of the blue. He gave up all the treasures of Egypt. If you've ever been to the Cairo Museum, and King Tut was just a teenage pharaoh. The man gave up everything to be obedient to to God and Jesus Christ. He gave up the riches of the world. And for 40 years out in the desert, can you imagine 40 years out in the desert, same old, same old, there's Mount Horab, there's the same mountain, same thing. Somebody says to him, well, what do you think your life will ever change? Well, no, I don't know. Years ago, I thought something would happen. Some of your lives are just same, 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 same job, same territory, same problems. But then God shows up in the burning bush, the butane bush, and delivers the people through him. You see the blue? Do you see that blue color? Isn't that exquisite? Some of these things are 4,000 years old. They're exquisitely blue. Blue Yushuptis. They put these in the, in the tombs by the hundreds. They thought there was a service the next God. In Pompeii, in the early 1800s, they found a pot of Egyptian blue paint. And they began to analyze it. And over the next 100 years, they're trying to find out how they did it. Because just we're talking about this stuff at three and 4,000 years old. It's still bright blue. I, in Oregon, where I live, it rains all the time. You know how you can tell it's getting to be spring? The rain gets warmer. But paint jobs don't last very long out there. They analyze this, the complex process of 1,000 degrees temperature and all these chemicals. It's very expensive. We can make a pot of Egyptian blue paint, but it costs so much money. But I could like it. But this is, that paint that they made shows they were technologically superior. I'd like to paint my house that way in Oregon, bright blue. The neighbors wouldn't like it. But it would last for hundreds of years. How are we doing with time? I don't want to run my time. I think I've, I'm out of time. I'm through. I'm finished. I'm kaput. I'm zero. I'm going, thanks. 